Thanks, Mike. Good morning. Everybody doing today? Good? All right, I want to welcome you guys to the Crossings Church. My name is Jake, and I'm glad that you guys are here. Um, if you guys would like to, uh, we have a couple things going on. We're getting pretty busy in the fall, so I'm going to run through those real quick before I jump in today. But in your bulletins, there's a lot of different invitations. And here at the Crossings Church, we really do encourage people to invite to the events that we have. Um, and so we actually have a Real Truth series that we're actually in. We started today, or we started yesterday, but the next two weeks we're going to be watching movies on a Saturday. And then we're going to, watch, we're going to do a sermon kind of based on some truths that we can see in the movie that can be related to Scripture and to our relationship with God. And so next week we're watching a movie called Spotlight. Um, it is a rated R movie, so we are asking that it's an adult-only movie, um, but we will have something for our kids as well and our kids' wing to watch a movie for them as well. And then the following week we're going to watch that new Ninja Turtle Mutant Mayhem movie. Um, so invite away to that. Um, and we'll be giving you guys some invites in your guys' bulletins that you guys can hand out to somebody else as well. Following the three Real Truth movies, we actually have a Nerf War coming up for our kids. Um, so kindergarten through fifth grade, we're going to have a Nerf War event for them. It's actually been kind of cool because we're going to do the Ninja Turtle movie, and hopefully we can invite from there to the Nerf War event uh, that following week. And so if you have kindergartners through fifth graders, um, or you know of some, this is a great event for them to be at. It's a free event. There will be some snacks, um, some light refreshments, and um, just a good time for those kids to get to know each other. So... Jumping in today to this, uh, this sermon, we are doing a real true cinema uh, for the next three weeks, like I had said, just based on movies that we have found uh, that we can find some kind of meaning or pull some, some sort of meaning out of uh, into, into scripture. And if you're following along with us today on our live stream, we're actually not going to be able to show these clips because we're going to have some clips patched in throughout the, movie, or throughout the sermon today. Uh, but we won't be able to show those on the live stream if you guys are listening in on us. But um, we chose this movie, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And uh, it's funny because I watched this movie, um, I don't know, like maybe two weeks ago to prepare for it. And we actually have a, uh, here at the Crossings Church, we have a model with a lot of churches that we partner with that we kind of go through the same sermons and we kind of walk through the same sermons together. And it's funny because I preach quite often, but this is actually the first sermon I've ever wrote by myself. <laughs> um, and so if it's terrible, it's all on me today. <laughs> I, can't put the, I can't put the finger at somebody else. Um, but so, uh, yeah, that's probably what's going to happen today. Um, but as I watch this movie, usually I'm pretty, I feel like I'm pretty skilled at watching something or seeing something and being able to pull something out of it very quickly, where I'm like, you know what, like, I know exactly what I want to do with that. I write a lot of cross-chat lessons for our college ministry. Um, I've done a lot of lessons at men's retreats and, and marriage retreats and all these different things, but a sermon I've never done. And so as I was watching through and, and, and walking through this movie, as soon as it was done, I was blank. Like, I had no idea what I wanted to talk about. I had no idea what I wanted to go and where I wanted to go in the direction. And I have a seven-year-old daughter um, who watched the movie with me. Her name's Peyton. And she was like, Dad, you could do this, or you could do that. Or what, what is it you're trying to do? I was like, well, I'm trying to look at, at this movie and figure out how I can put it together in a sermon to relate it to something in Scripture. And she's like, oh, okay, just talk about Spider-Man. I was like, I can't preach Spider-Man. <laughs> like, <laughs> Spider-Man is not in the Bible. And she was like, okay, well, what about the spider girl? Because I'm going to be here for Halloween, so we'll just talk about her. And I'm like, you don't get what I'm trying to do right now, okay? And then the last week or so, I've, I've uh, had my computer on my back porch. I've been kind of figuring stuff out there. And she'd come out there, and she'd be like, you figured it out yet, Dad? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> and she's like, well, just, okay, fine. Just talk about Jesus then. And I was like, yeah, that's the point, is like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it something about Jesus. But it finally clicked when she said that, and I was like, who better to talk, to, to talk about than Jesus with the Spider-Man movie? Because if you've seen the Spider-Man movie, you see that Miles Morales, um, he is not like every other Spider-Man. And I titled this lesson, Going Against the Grain, Not Your Ordinary Neighborhood Spider-Man, because the tagline of Spider-Man is just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. 
And as you watch the movie of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, you start to realize that there are all these different universes that are patched together, and inside of every universe, there's a different Spider-Man. And they come together, and, they, and you see in this movie how many different Spider-Men that there are in, in, the, in, this, multi, in this multiverse. Um, but Miles is a little different. You know, and Miles chooses to represent Spider-Man a little differently than the other Spider-Men do. And as you watch this movie, you start to realize he is going against the grain. He is not your typical friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. He's doing something different. And I thought, you know, that's interesting. Because when I look at churches in America, I feel like there's a lot of people who are just your typical, ordinary neighborhood Christian. And I say Christian in quotes because I believe that there are a lot of people that go to church that don't really practice Christianity. I believe there's a lot of people in churches in America that choose to go to church because it's what everybody else does. It's because it's what we're supposed to do. But when you look at statistics in Christian churches, you start to realize that there's not much difference than there is in the world. That divorce rates are very similar in Christian churches as they are in the world. That there are second generation Christians that should be happening, but kids are leaving the church rather than building a faith in the church. They're not following the footsteps of their parents. You start to see time and time again these similarities that happen. Depression is just as high in the church as it is outside of the church. Insecurities, there's mishaps, there's all these different things. And if you look at a national statistic, the reality is, statistically, Christianity, percentage-wise, is on the decline in the United States. There's actually a new, um, they call it the nuns, which is uh, a percentage of Americans that don't believe anything. They just claim nothing. I don't, I don't really believe or care to think about anything. And if that's true, it's so important for us to realize that Christianity and this title and this tagline of being a Christian, in some ways, there needs to be a call to go against the grain. And just like in the Spider-Man movie, just like Miles was able to go against the grain, Jesus did the same thing. Jesus went against the grain. You see, because Jesus claimed to be a Christian just like the Pharisees. Jesus claimed to be the same exact thing, but Jesus went against the grain of Christianity in the first century. And Jesus chose to go in a different direction. And because of that, we have what we have today. And so I thought, man, what a great illustration to use a movie like this and to find truths and the way that Miles chose to go against the grain. Because I, guys, I desperately feel that churches in America need men and women to go against the grain of other churches in America. And I'm not sitting here trying to throw our church up there as like we're better than everybody else. And I'm not trying to make this a church versus church thing, but I'm saying that there are people inside of churches that need to act differently than the damage that Christianity has done on this world. You know, the number one reason why people don't go to church anymore? Hypocrisy. It's not because of what the world is doing to them. It's what the people inside of the church are doing to them to make them not want to go to church. And so our world desperately needs Christians to act differently than Christians, if that makes sense. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is how to go against the grain of a typical Christian. And I put that in air quotes because the reality is, if you're a Christian, you should be doing it in accordance to Scripture. But I put it in air quotes because I do believe that there's a lot of situations and people in churches that they claim Christianity, but yet their life does not reflect that. And there's a huge need to go against that grain in our lives. So what we're going to talk about is just why. Why is it so important for us to go against the grain of that typical Christian? Well, number one is because it's God's design. And we have some notes inside of, our, inside of that bulletin. If you guys would like to follow along and if you guys want to know the verses we're running through, um, uh, you can follow along with those notes. And we're going to look at some things that Jesus said about this idea of going against the grain today. And so number one is that it's, it's God's design. It was always God's design to go against the grain. Jesus himself says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. You see, Jesus himself 
knew that it was necessary to go against the grain. He knew that this was what life was going to call us to do. Have you guys ever seen the movie the, or seen the show The Chosen? One of the coolest things in that show is not even the show. <laughs> it's the opening credit scene, to me at least. Because if you guys have watched that show and you see all those gray fish float in one way, right? And then you see one blue fish flip and turn the other direction. One of the coolest illustrations, one of the coolest openings I've ever seen to any show. And that's a great representation of what Jesus was trying to get people to understand, saying, listen, everyone's following this gate. Everybody's going in this direction. We're just moving in life this way. But man, it's, that's not the design. That's not the way we were supposed to live. We're, we're supposed to turn and go against that. We're supposed to go against the current. We're supposed to look a little different. We're supposed to stand out a little bit. It has always been God's design for your life to not just be a follower of the world. And so it's so important for us to understand God doesn't just want us to live this life like everybody else. God's design for us was not just to follow in line and just, okay, well, what's the, what's the American dream? Okay, we want to we wanna get a good education. We want to get married. We want to have a family. We want to have a nice house. We want to have security. We want to have, you know, grandkids maybe. We wanna, we, and we want to live a good life and we want to die. You know, that's kind of that's the way that life has been mapped out in, in our society. And God says, man, that's not what I intended. That was not my design. Jesus told him that it's not, it's meant to go the other way. It's meant to not look like that. It's meant to, and yes, there are some blessings that can happen and some of those things may come into light, but that's not why we were created. We were created to go in a completely different direction and show something completely different. And God's design was not just to follow this American dream, but God's design was for us to go against the grain and show and look for something different. So number one is because it's God's design that he wants us to live that way. Number two is because if we go against the grain of a typical Christian, it can expose hypocrisy. The number one reason why people leave churches is hypocrisy. You know the best way to expose hypocrisy? is to live differently. It's to go against the grain. Literally to live differently. It says in, in Matthew 5, 17. It says, Jesus says, Don't think that I have come to destroy the law of Moses or the teaching of the prophets. I have not come to destroy their teachings, but to do what they said. You see, Jesus' intentions were to never just destroy the image of Christianity. It was never to just throw everything that had already been done out the window. And that was never Miles' intention as well in the, in the Spider-Verse movie. Watch this clip that we have on, on what Miles chose to do and say to expose the hypocrisy that was going on within the Spider-Man realm.
it's crazy because they literally just wanted him to do what they were all doing. They wanted him to live the same way that they were living. They wanted him to make the same decisions that they were making. And Miles said, that's not what I'm going to do. That's not how I'm going to live. And Jesus said the same thing. It doesn't dismiss the entire, the entire idea of what Spider-Man stands for, but there was a different way to go about it. And that's exactly what Jesus did in Matthew 5, 17. He says, don't think that I've come to just destroy everything that the law has already said. Don't, don't think that I've come to just rewrite things. I've come to show you how to do it the right way. And just like Miles does here, he says, listen, there is a way to do this differently. There's a way that we can go about this differently, and it's going to go against the grain of every other Spider-Man in that movie. And Jesus showed that same exact way to Christianity. And he said, there's a completely different way to do this. And I'm going to show you how to do it. I've come to live it. You see, it's, it's pretty easy to call out hypocrites. It's very easy to do that. Hypocrisy is in the church, there's no doubt. You know what's hard, though? is to show somebody how to live differently. That's the problem in America. That's the problem with churches. Is that Christians are very, are very, very quick to, to accuse hypocrisy in the church. They're very quick to throw people under the bus, but they are not very quick to live it out themselves. They're not very quick to change and, and go against the grain and say, you know what? Man, there is some hypocrisy in this church. There are some things going on that should not be going on. I need to be a better example. You see, Jesus did both. It's not wrong to call out hypocrites. It's not wrong to call people to a higher standard. Jesus literally did that with the Pharisees. He called them hypocrites multiple times in Scripture. But he didn't leave it at that. But that's the problem a lot of times in the church is people just want to call people something else, call them out, and they leave it at that. And they expect the other person to change with taking no responsibility to change themselves in the first place. And I believe if we had more people that went against the grain and said, you know what, that is so wrong. I've got to show people the right way to do this. What would churches look like today? What would our lives look like today? What could we do with that? Because this is a snowball effect. Because if you can choose to show, instead of just calling people out and yelling at people, if you can choose to show, just like Jesus said, he came to do, I came to do what they said. I came to show them. Well, that rolls into our third point because if you can choose to go against the grain, why would you want to go against the grain? Because if you expose hypocrisy, you can create a movement. Because it can create a movement. If we're willing to live differently, if we're willing to go against the grain in our lives and say, man, this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the world something different in my relationship with God. It's not going to look like your typical churchgoer. It's not going to look like your typical Christian. It's not going to look like your typical person. I'm going to show something completely different. That will cause a movement. And it will do it in two different ways. First, it will cause and create a movement internally. Something will change within you. Jesus did that. Jesus lived and showed something completely different, and he paid the price, and he died on the cross because of it. And you know what, you know what happened? A movement was created. And what did this movement look like in the first century with his disciples? Well, let's look at this in Acts 2, 42-46. What kind of movement happened within them internally? It says, They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and to the prayers. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal of celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. When's the last time you looked in the mirror and liked what you saw? When's the last time you looked at your life and you liked what you saw? When's the last time that you sat around a dinner table exuberant and joyful for what you had in front of you? When's the last time you went to work with a complete joy and praise for what you had been given? When is the last time that you looked at the relationships that God has put into your life and felt like you were in a place that you belonged? 
You see, I feel like more of us are on the opposite side of this, where we look at our lives and we say, how did I get here? And we look at our relationships and we feel alone. We look at our jobs and we feel like we hate them. And we look at our lives and we don't feel a movement. We feel stuck. Going against the grain can change all of that. Living life in a way that is different than everybody else is living can create a stirring within your own heart. It can create a change of heart. It can create a relationship like these guys had with one another. That's what I desire for. I desire to, to feel like my life is going in a certain direction and that there's momentum and that there's love and that there's support and that there's joy and there's excitement. And sometimes I just don't feel that way. I remember when I was in high school, I didn't know really who God was. I felt very alone. I felt very abandoned because my dad wasn't in the picture. I felt a lot of things that made me feel like I could never have movement in my life. I felt stuck and I felt like I was going to be called to repeat a cycle within my family that I had always seen. But fortunately for me, God had intervened. and God had put some people in my life and gave me some hope. And once I realized how far Jesus went against the grain to come find me, it changed me. It changed my perspective on life. It changed my characteristics. It changed everything that I stood for. It changed everything that I wanted in life. It changed, it changed so many things. And God started putting things into my life, putting things into my heart that I had never felt in my life before. And maybe some of you guys are at that point today where you just feel stuck. You feel lost. And you feel like you don't know what you're going to do with life. My encouragement to you is to not just be your normal churchgoer, but to go against the grain and find why Jesus did what he did, because it will stir you and move you in a way that you have no idea. And when you can choose to live and feel and act that way, then you'll realize the second point here is so important, because when you go against the grain, it won't just move you internally, but it will also move you externally. See, the very next verse that comes after, the very next sentence after this internal movement was working within these people's hearts, the very next thing in Acts 2. <clears throat> verse 47, every day their number grew as God added to those being saved. You see, this movement that Jesus created did not just end with him. It did change the hearts and create a movement in the hearts of the people around him. And because of that, it created a movement externally and people continued to see something different. You know, I desire more than anything in my life now that I feel like I have this movement and this momentum because of what Jesus has done for me is for my family who is still stuck in a cycle to break free of it. I would love to see my family members see what I see. I would love to see my brothers and sisters have what I have, my biological ones. But it starts with the movement that God has put within me. Then and only then will people see something different and want to be something different. So, I don't know where you guys are at today with this idea, but it's so important for us to see and understand what our lives can do and what they can change. Watch this clip after Miles has already started this, started this movement himself. Watch how people can change because of what Miles has done. Watch this clip.
it's crazy that if you know the story of Gwen and you watch the movie, she was one of those people that was just going to go with everybody else in our first clip whenever Miles was trapped. And he's like, no, I'm not standing for this. She was, she was going to let her dad die because it was going to be one of those events that had to happen to fulfill the Spider-Man prophecy, right? And through this scene and through this movie, she goes back home and a relationship starts to bond with her and her dad. And at one point in her life, she had felt that lostness. She had felt that she was lost and she had no idea how she could overcome any of this stuff. She was willing to let her dad go. She didn't, she felt stuck. But one thing she learned from Miles was that anything's possible. That's how Jesus wants us to live so that people around us can feel that way. God has put Jesus in your life so that you can live, so that the people that circulate around you can look at your life, look at the momentum that you've created, and they can say, you know what? I believe anything's possible because I see what Jesus has done in you, Jake. Because I see what Jesus has done in you I can now have some hope. That's the whole message of the gospel. It's for us to live in a different way, in a different light, to create momentum so other people can see what we really represent. And I'm sure there's a lot of us that desire to go against that grain, and there's a lot of us that desire for other people in our lives to see that light and to go against that grain as well. And so I hope that you guys understand and realize that there is a desperate need to go against the grain in your relationship with God. There has got to be a drastic approach on how you choose to live your life, a radical approach in your relationship with God and how that should show up on your day-to-day -day life. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to end on just some applicable things that we can do about that. If this is so true and this is what we want to do, well, how do we go about it? How, how in the world do you go against the grain in life? How, how are we supposed to do this? Okay? So the first one is you need to understand what you're capable of. You have to understand what you're capable of. It says in Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. On your own, you probably can't do much. You really can't. You know, the Bible makes that pretty clear. But the Bible is also very clear that with God in our lives, we can do anything. Just like Gwen showed us. We can do anything. Anything's possible. And it's important for you to understand your worth. To know how valuable you are and, what, and how capable you are in your relationship with God. Let's watch another clip. This is on Miles. And how he starts to realize and understand what he truly is capable of.
boldness about life? Don't you, don't you wish that you could go out and say, man, I can go out in the world. I can do anything. As a parent, don't you want your kids to feel that way? I have three daughters. I want them to feel that. I want my daughters to feel like, man, I can go out in the world and I can do anything. And, and, and we, we instill that in our kids. You know, we, we, do, we do the best we can to make them feel that way. But just like Miles, he had to realize on his own that that's what he was capable of. But it's crazy because once he, once he realized he was capable of that, he goes back to the source and says, you know why I can do all this stuff, Mom? It's because of you. And that's the exact same thing that God is trying to get us to understand in our lives. That we are capable of anything but that there is a source as to why we are capable of anything. And it's because of what God is willing to do for us in our own lives. You see, we can, live, we can play the pride game and we can say, I can do anything because of who I am. I did this myself. You know, I'll take the credit. Or we can look at our lives like Miles and say, I can do anything. And it's because of you, God. It's because of what you've given me. It's because of what you blessed me with. I can, I can literally do anything in life. You know, uh, our campus ministry, um, we, so before school starts, every year we do a bonfire at my house, the college students that are about to go back to school. And it's just kind of a way to kind of fire people up and uh, just give them an opportunity to just like, the very next day is when classes start. And I want our college students here at the Crossing Church to feel like they can do anything, that they can take that campus and just storm it. And they can find people, and they can reach people, and they can show them something different. Literally everything we've been talking about today, that's what that bonfire's for. You're called to go against the grain. You're called to go change these college campuses, and we have this bonfire every single year. And you college kids will probably remember this, but I said that there is one thing that is really holding us back. That if we could figure out this one thing, there's, there, we would be unstoppable. We, we would create, you know, a lot, of, a lot of churches believe that there's this, like, haunting number of 200. Like, if you can get your congregation over 200, you'll, you'll explode, but it, it takes forever to, to, to grasp that. I believe the same thing in campus ministry. I think that number's 30. I think you can, you can hover around a 30, 30 or so members in your campus ministry, and it just takes forever to finally get over that hump. But once you do, man, things are going. And I said that to our campus ministry this, this semester, and I said, man... We, we are on the cusps of something great. But do any of you guys remember, you college students, do you, any of you guys remember what I said that thing was? By any chance? Cap capabilities. I said, the only thing that's holding our campus ministry back is that you guys have no clue what you're really capable of. There's so much insecurity. There's so much naiveness. There's so much timidness. There's so much just... I don't think I can do this in our campus ministry right now. And so I called our campus leaders up, and I had them talk one at a time to encourage and say, I want you to dream for these guys and show them what they're really capable of and show them what you've been through and what you're capable of because of what God has done within you. And we, we reminisced on some old stories of what we used to do in our campus ministry when we first moved out here. You know, we streamed some UFC fights that we probably shouldn't have because it might have been illegal at the time at the college university. And we thought we were getting in trouble because a bunch of cops showed up, but the cops showed up and they were like, hey, I heard you guys are streaming the fights. And I was like, maybe, what do you want to know? <laughs> you know? And they were like, well, we just want to know if we can come in on our shift and watch it with you guys. And I'm like, man, we ain't getting in trouble. We got the cops here. Like, they're going to come in. And I was like, yeah, call everybody up. And so, like, we had this crazy scene. And there's, you know, there were seven of us in the campus ministry at that time, seven or eight of us. And we had over 100 people in this place that we probably shouldn't have been doing it, but we did it anyway. And we've had these different things, and we've had different movements, and we've had, and I, and I, and I dreamed for our college students. And I said, if you would just get to understand what you are really capable of, there is not one person on this college campus that we cannot reach. Our campus ministry has grown to this number of like 30 or 30 or 30, 30 people or so, and we are right on the cusp of something great. I was like, who can we not reach? I was like, I was literally like, who? Who can we not reach? 
Because look at our ministry. We have connections to anybody on this college campus. You want to reach a black person? Check. We've got those people here. You want to reach a white person? we got those people. You want a poor person? we got those people. You want rich people? we got those people. You know, who can we not reach? we got athletes? we got those people. we got musically inclined. Who, like, I was just like, who? Who is on this campus that we are not capable of changing their lives? Who do we not have a connection to that we're like, oh, man, that person is unreachable. Like, there's nobody in our ministry that can connect with them. It's not possible. And then I said a prayer. You guys remember that prayer? A lot of you guys remember that prayer because I've never prayed like that before. I said a prayer and I challenged God. I don't think I've ever done that before. And I said, I said, God, I'm calling you out right now. I'm challenging you. I want to see what you're really capable of in this campus ministry if we choose to go all in for you. Show me how powerful you are if we choose to live it all out for you. The very next day, we baptized two college kids. Very next day. First day of school. And and one of them, I heard, there you are, yep. One of of them said, man, this is just happening because Jake said that prayer last night. He just said, he said that prayer challenge God, it's happening. And I was like, that's crazy. And then we had a cross chat the next week at Maggie and Nathan's house. And I heard there was like 50 people there. Insane. And we have tons of Bible studies already set up. And we're only a few weeks into campus. And I'm sitting here, and as I'm, as I'm trying to lead this campus ministry, as we're having our small groups, I'm literally continuing to install into our college members' minds and hearts Do you see what you are capable of? Do you see now what God can really do with you if you choose to go all in, if you choose to go against the grain? And I encourage it that this is not just, this is not just exclusive to a campus ministry. For some of you guys, you're dealing with some struggles, some habits, some of you guys, you wish that there's some things that could be mended within your families. For some of you guys, you wish that there could be just a different outlook on life, just a different perspective and a different direction. And I'm literally telling you guys, I'm pleading with you that God can tell you and change you and do things with you that you have no idea what you are really capable of with God. You don't. It says, it says uh, in... It says in Psalm 16, 8, it says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Man, if we just kind of believed in ourselves a little bit more, and we just kind of understood what would this church look like? What would your heart look like? What would your life look like? What would your families look like? God can do so much, but you've got to understand what you're capable of. Miles did. He finally got it. And what did he say? With, with pride, he said, I beat them all. Mom, I went out there, I, I fought all those different spider people, and I beat them all. How cool would it be for you guys to look at the giants in your life, the sin in your life, the things that Satan's thrown in your life, and say, you know what, God? I went out there, and I realized what, what I was really capable of, and God, I beat them all. I didn't let sin get in my life. I didn't let it corrupt me. I didn't let it change the trajectory of what you had with me. I, I understood what I was finally capable of, and I beat it all. That's what you're capable of. That's what we're capable of. So not only do you need to understand what you're capable of, but secondly, you need to train yourself for the fight. You've got to train yourself for the fight. The fight's here whether you like it or not. Life is going to be hard whether you like it or not. Whether you're a Christian or not, it's going to be hard. The question is, are you training yourself? 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17 says, But as for you, continue in what you've learned and what you've become convinced of because you know that those are from... You know, because you know those from whom you learned it. And from how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, there's two things in here that you need to look at to train yourself on. And you can circle these as well. And the first part of this verse, it says, because you know those from whom you learned it. You see, you need people in your life. If you're going to train the right way, if you're going to train for this life, you need people in your life. Even in the movie, right? 
How many times did you hear little side joke comments that, that Peter Parker, the older Spider-Man, is like, I trained him that, I mentored him, you know, I showed him how to do that. I must, be, I must not be that bad of a mentor because I showed him how to do that, right? And he makes all these jokes, right? And even Spider-Gwen, you know, she had the older lady as well, the, the girl on the bike. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. But, yeah, what was it? Jess, yes, right? And so she even has her, because even at the very beginning of the movie, there's like a joke where she's like, please adopt me. Because she's like, she wants to be, meant, like she desires for somebody more mature in her life to show her and to be around her. Just like Spider-Man, uh, Miles had Parker, Peter Parker. Do you have somebody in your life? Do you have somebody in your life that when they look at you, they can say, I taught them how to do that. I showed them that. I must not be that bad of a mentor because look at them now. Do you have those people? And if you don't, it may be time to evaluate if you're really training yourself for the fight the way that you should. See, we can't live this life, go against the grain by ourselves. We need people in our lives. Second, part of this is all scripture. In verse 16, you can circle all scripture because you need God's word. You don't just need people, but you need his word as well to guide you. It talks about four different traits there, teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training. What the Bible is useful for in our lives. You see, the Bible is meant to prepare us and equip us for the hardships because being a Christian doesn't mean life's going to be easy. The Bible actually says the exact opposite. He says, you're going to have troubles in this life. But a wise Christian, a Christian that's going to go against the grain, doesn't just pretend that church is going to save them from everything, but they prepare themselves for when life gets hard. You know how many times I've seen Christians that look like they have it together, and then a divorce happens, or a death happens, or a relapse happens, and then they shut themselves down, and then they leave the church, and they blame God, and then they spiral downhill themselves? because they thought the church was there to protect them from these things, and they never really prepared themselves for those things. I've seen that too many times. But then I've also watched Christians who are trying to go against the grain, who have been training and prepping themselves, and have watched loved ones die before their time. They've watched people relapse that have hurt them. They've watched things happen. And instead of falling away from God, they lean into God. Because they knew they were training for these moments. They knew that storms were going to come and they were trying to get themselves ready. When hard things happen in your life, what do you tend to do? That's an indication of your training. Do you choose to isolate and spiral downhill? Or do you choose to listen to God and lean in? A great indication of what's going on in your training. And then thirdly, we need to live for something greater than ourselves. Lastly, we have to live for something greater than ourselves. Jesus gave us the ultimate illustration of this. In John 15, 12, and 13, he says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has none than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You see, we're going to take communion here in a second. And I want you guys to understand that going against the grain doesn't mean anything unless we had an example like Jesus who went against the grain and put it all out there. To live for something greater than ourselves, we have the greatest illustration and the greatest example and the greatest reality in what Jesus did on the cross. That he was willing to lay down his life and put everything to the side all his desires, all his wants, all his needs, he put everything to the side and laid it all out because he wanted to live for something greater. We can look at that example today, and I want us to be grateful for that example. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take communion. I want you to think about that sacrifice and think about how much he was willing to lay out on the line for you and how that can be modeled in your lives. Let's pray. God, I just want to thank you so much for sending your son to give us the ultimate sacrifice, to give us the ultimate example of what a real hero looks like, to give us the ultimate idea of what a real Christian looks like all around. 
And God, I fall short in so many areas, and this is one of the greatest ones that I fall short in, God. It's just so hard to want to lay everything out for God, uh, for you, Lord, and just to, to lay it all on the line and just to give everything up for others. It's so hard. But I'm so grateful to have somebody like Jesus that was willing to do that, to give me that example, to continue as I walk through life, to be reminded of that sacrifice so I can strive for that every single day, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the
How can you not get fired up? How can you not get chills watching that, right? You see, what's so crazy is at the end of this movie, Gwen forms this team, and they're willing to leave their own universes, their own worlds, to go help their friend. And what's so crazy about Gwen leading this team was Gwen was the same one at the very beginning of this movie that got kicked out of the band because she couldn't find where she belonged. But yet it comes full circle at the end of the movie that she finds a team because she built it herself. And she wanted to build something new and show something new because she knew it was so much more about living in our own little universe that there was other people that needed the help. In Philippians 2, 3-4, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others about yourself, above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You understand that this church was established years ago because there were churches that we could not figure out wanted the same thing that we wanted. And you want to know what we want? is just to help people. That's all we want here at the Cross of Churches. We want to help people see Jesus for who he really is. And if we can do that, we believe we can change people's hearts and lives forever. And it can be multi-generational. And it can transcend into different countries. It can transcend all over the world. But we have to get out of our little universe just like all those people at the end were willing to do. And the coolest thing, the coolest moment for me in this movie was what Gwen said at the very end. Three words. You want in? You see, it was an open invitation to be a part of something greater than themselves. It was an open invitation for all these other different people to leave their worlds and to live for something greater. And that's what I'm calling you guys to today. Here at the Crossings Church, we want to live for something greater than ourselves. Here at the Crossings Church, we are trying to go against the grain and be something different for the world because the world desperately needs something different. And my question to you today is, do you want in? And if you do, I would encourage you guys to pull out this communication card because this is your opportunity to figure out how you can get connected to something that is so much greater than yourself. It first starts with your relationship with God. And if you don't know who God is, you don't know what this Jesus guy is and what he's done and what he's willing to do for your life, if you don't understand what that sacrifice was and how that can create a movement within your life, maybe check that you'd like a personal Bible study and that you'd like to get connected and figure out how in the world you can figure out what it is that Jesus is wanting to do with your life. Maybe you've just never had that community and that connection. Maybe, you, maybe you've, you've got these hardships and these things going on in your lives, and you're just like, I just don't know how to deal with them. I've never been trained. I've never had people look at scripture with me. I've never had people in general. Maybe talk about how you'd like to know more about our small groups and get some people in your lives that can say, hey, I taught you how to do that. Hey, you know, maybe, you know, a year down the road, you're going to have somebody in your life now because you got to know our small groups, and they're going to say, man, I taught you that. I remember a year ago when you were messed up and you showed up to church for a Spider-Man series, and you want to get connected with our small groups, and look at your life now. I taught you some things. It was a Paul to a Timothy, you know? Somebody comes in your life. Maybe you've got some things going on in your life that you just don't know how to overcome, some deep, dark hurt, some, some things. We have, we have classes here within our church with people who have dealt with those same problems. And now they teach those things, and they walk through those things, not through their own arrogance, but through their own experiences. And said, I've fallen short just like you are right now. And I've worked my way back up because I know what I'm now capable of. I know what I can do now because of what God has given me. And I want to show you and teach you how that's happened to me. That's what our ministry classes do. But I don't know where you guys are at today, but I know that God wants you in. God wants you to go against the grain and God wants to change your life. But it's up to you to leave your little universe and live for something greater than yourself. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for just offering me the opportunity to live for something greater. God, I really had it lined out and mapped out that I just didn't want to be what I saw in my family. And I, have, I thought I had this idea of what I was going to be and what I was going to do. I, didn't, I grew up without a dad, so I thought I was going to be a better dad. So I, I already had these things mapped out, God. 
but I was still doing it in my universe. It was still my world. It was still my life. But God, I'm so grateful that you sent your son to show me what it really looks like to leave my universe, to leave my world, to leave the things that made me comfortable, leave my passions and my dreams and put them to the side and say, you know what? I want to be something greater. I want to live for something greater. And God, because of that, you have blessed my life and you have given me a new world that is better than any world I could have ever created on my own. And God, I pray that we can have the humility today to look at our lives, to look at the worlds that we live in, the things that we do, and say, man, I just, I want to get out of this, and I trust that you will give me a world that is better than I have ever known. I pray also in your son's name. Amen. When the